Welcome to AI Mistakes, where we explore the intriguing world of artificial intelligence. Today, we're diving into the history of the Turing test. All right, who's this guy, Alan Turing? Alan Turing, a British mathematician in computer science, first introduced the Turing test in a 1950 paper. In that paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, Turing, who is also known for breaking the Enigma code, ask this now famous question, can machines think? The answer to that question, well, there were a couple of quandaries involved. But here, let's see how Turing broke it down. Turing proposed a simple yet intriguing test called <laughs> the imitation game. You might have seen the Hollywood movie recently. This game basically involved a human judge who would have a dialogue or a communication, hidden correspondence with the computer. And so that would be a machine to human conversation that would drive a series of questions. And that series of questions would be answered by the computer. And based upon that response, the judge would determine whether or not the answers were coming from a machine. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is the original Turing test was really more about gender imitation. In other words, the machine would try to convince the judge that it was a human of the opposite gender. But as the AI field evolved and we learned more, so did the Turing test because we started to understand a little better how we could benchmark. So it became a more general test of the machine's intelligence and its ability to display intelligent behavior. Most often, it was indistinguishable from human behavior by using a series of tricks rather than being particularly smart or human-like. Here's the way the Turing test typically works. Basically, you have three people or things involved. You have a judge, you have a human respondent, and you have the AI. And essentially, those roles are handled in such a way that the judge is conversing with an actual human and the judge is conversing with the AI. So they go back and forth on a text-based interface. Now, the whole point here is to convince the judge that they're a human. That applies across the board. So whether it's the actual human respondent or it's the AI, the goal is to have the judge decide that they're the human. If the machine is able to convince the judge that they're a human, then it is considered to have passed the Turing test. So now <clears throat> here's the thing. There's been variations of this built over time, okay? So some tests involve multiple judges, some tests involve multiple respondents, creating a, a larger pool of data for the judge to draw from. And then they've also created other criteria. So things that allow for the passing, the machine's ability to, to mimic human conversation, to prioritize problem solving, or even to do creative thinking. And <clears throat> as they've added variations, the problem has continued to materialize that essentially it's very difficult to get to a point where it's indistinguishable in a way that everyone feels is fair and equitable. And therein lies the problem, but there's more to it than that. So what do I mean there's more to it than that? Essentially, as the test has been conducted over time, we've, we've learned, okay? The tests actually began all the way back in the 1960s. So Turing created the test in the 1950s, and we already found ways to use the test in the 1960s. That's how quickly things were evolving in that period of time. So the folks that were working on AI back then really felt that this was just around the corner. This was not a long, far off thing. This was something that we could do in the near term. So someone created a chatbot in the 1960s. It was called Eliza, and it was built by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT. And essentially it used a pattern matching technique to simulate conversation. Now, it didn't come anywhere close to passing the Turing test, but it did create a lot of discussion and a lot of folks started to talk about this idea of creating a chatbot or a natural language processing system. So it, it went, it absolutely got noticed, but there's more because in the 1970s, another chatbot called Perry 
was developed by psychiatrist Kenneth Colby. Now, his, his chatbot covered a totally different area. And it was really about simulating a person that had paranoid schizophrenia. And so one of the, one of the things that they did was trying to fool the judge into believing it was a human respondent by adding this additional diagnosis. Having that be a part of the situation, the theory was that it was going to be more believable to, to have been a human. Now, fast forward to 1991, and we have the Loebner Prize, which was an annual Turing test competition, <clears throat> and it involved chatbots from all over the world. And again, the same goal was to convince a judge that the respondent was a human rather than a computer. And at this point, no chatbot had ever won a Turing test. It was not something that was really successful in the past, but we've kept doing this because there was always the opportunity that suddenly we could change and overnight you'd have a chat bot or a computer that could pass the Turing test. And basically in, in this competition, they were trying to get to the most human-like computer. So they adapted the test because it was very difficult to win, honestly. Then fast forward a few more years, you have some additional tests and this chat bot called Eugene Gustman. In 2014, it was developed by a team of Russians and Ukrainians, and basically it was designed to simulate a 13-year-old boy. And this was a little bit controversial, and the reason for this was basically that it passed the Turing test by convincing 33% of the judges that it was a human respondent. So this particular test had multiple judges, and only a portion of them believed that the bot was human, uh, but this was said to have been enough to reflect success in having passed the Turing test. Now, the other controversial part of this particular chatbot was the fact that it was intended to be a 13-year-old boy. And so, you know, the level of intelligence that had to be demonstrated was admittedly different because we're talking about an adolescent child, not an adult. So, this is really where things began to get off the rails, as it were. When we talk about AI mistakes, this is the time at which the Turing test really lost its usefulness. Because here you have a group that says, hey, we beat it. We, we created a bot that passed the Turing test. Under these specific circumstances, it only convinced a portion of the judges. It was unique to a 13-year-old boy. And so... Now the test is kind of tainted at this point. But wait, there's more because there's an actual argument about whether or not this Turing test is even a valid test. So what's wrong with the Turing test? Well, you see, there's this thing called the Chinese room argument. There is a philosopher by the name of John Searle. And basically his argument says that passing the Turing test doesn't mean that a machine truly understands or thinks like a human. Instead, it's simply following a set of rules to produce a human-like response without genuine comprehension. Now, this idea of the Chinese room argument effectively works like this. You have a box, and inside the box, you don't know what's in there. It could be a person, could be a machine, could be a computer, could be really anything, honestly. The, the entire point is that the room is something that you're not able to see inside of. And on a note, you write a message to ask a question and you slide the note into the room and some mechanism inside the room takes that and spits out a response. You have no idea how that response got back to you and you don't get to know. But you can provide a response to the question without having any human aspect at all. And in fact, this is the quintessential problem that we have even in AI today, because as we're building these large language models with billions and trillions of parameters, we can ask questions and get an intelligible result. But ultimately, the way that a large language model functions is simply by predicting the next word. So given enough information to draw from, statistically being able to identify what the logical next word is, doesn't mean that the machine has any comprehension or understanding of what is actually being asked. It just means that it has the ability to predict the next word 
in a reasonable way. And this is where we get into the difficulty of today's AI. It absolutely has utility and usefulness, but is it a level of artificial intelligence that we've not reached before? Is it on the way to AGI? Well, I think there's a lot of debate about that. And while there are a lot of people out there that are saying we're moments away from AGI, others believe that it is still decades or more away from us reaching that point. Certainly the large language models are a move toward AGI because they are not specialized to a particular data set. It's not like an intelligent system that has a particular area that it will only work on. Tools like ChatGPT allow us to cover all sorts of different domains and learn about all sorts of things. And I use it on a daily basis because it helps me get my work done. But ultimately, you know, this problem of the Chinese room really helps us focus and understand when we talk about AI and its ability to do something, we still really don't understand how it works. It really is a black box and we have a lot to learn, but it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of opportunity for us to take advantage of it and do something useful with it. So let's go a little further. These criticisms and limitations, researchers have tried to find, okay, we need a new test because clearly the Turing test is not good enough for us to ascertain the value or the performance of a given artificial intelligence. So one new model they came up with is this thing called the Winograd Schema Challenge. And basically that is around natural language processing. And for this test, it's presented with a series of sentences that require some amount of common sense reasoning. In other words, you can't merely get the answer from contextually understanding the question. And these are really interesting because when we start getting into the identification of pronouns, the sentence construction, there's a lot of quandaries that come out of these kinds of questions. And we found this to be a really good step above the Turing test because it's not as simple as being able to break down the sentence and spit out an answer. This is an area where the more recent models have actually performed pretty well because not only are they able to answer the question, they are able to seemingly understand the context of the question that's being asked. So the Turing test has been a really useful thing for us, but I think at this point, it's valuable to consider what we've learned. Any system needs to be tested or validated in order for us to ensure that it's working as we expect. But the biggest problem with AI is that we don't fully understand how it's actually working. And so developing new ways to identify and benchmark how effective a given AI system is, is really valuable. How do we know? Well, number one, it provided utility in the early days. It gave us insights into, is this working well? And as you can tell from the history, it really took until the 20th, 21st century for us to identify that it was no longer useful. It provided a way for us to continue working against the problem and identifying if progress had been made. One of the other indicators of the success of the Turing test is the fact that it shows up in pop culture. Now, is pop culture the best guide of is something useful? Probably not, to be totally honest, but let's be real. I mean, look, it showed up in some very well-known movies covering artificial intelligence and robotics. The Imitation Game was a really good example, a really great film about breaking the code, but it, it rounded out and helped communicate the Turing test at the, end of the at the end of the film. I'm also a big fan of Ex Machina, a really wonderful piece of science fiction art that was furthering this understanding. And it is these wonderful pieces of science fiction that help us to better understand what the future might look like and to build a new world that's going to be successful because we're thinking about how robots and artificial intelligence can advance the position of humankind, but also the places where things could go terribly wrong. So there's a lot to learn. And here's the reality. We're going to keep finding new tests to run. Today, the tests that we're seeing are the benchmarks of models like GPT-4 and having it take the GRE test, having it take the the LCAT or the MCAT, the, the, the law and the medical tests. And we are seeing that in many cases, these models are performing better on the test than some humans are able to. So we've reached a point where 
Whether or not the machine actually understands or comprehends what's being asked, the answer that is returning seems to make sense. It seems to be the right answer. And so as we continue to identify where the machine is able to effectively help and to enrich the knowledge or enrich the action of a human in completing a given task, that's where the value is here. And so as we're developing systems, as we're developing solutions that take advantage of AI and really help us to solve problems, we'll need to identify ways that we can firm and validate that it's doing the job that we intended it to do. For me, a lot of the use cases are not asking mathematical questions or things that have a solid answer, but it's creativity. I really enjoy using tools like Midjourney that let me create art because I'm not a good artist, but I can type a prompt into the machine and it spits out a beautiful array of colors that seems to make sense as an image. Or in doing compositional writing, a lot of times I have white page syndrome, so it's very difficult for me to get started. But once I have something on the page, I then know where to go next. And so you find ways to apply that artificial intelligence in a way that is meaningful and valuable for you. And at the end of the day, that's what we're here to do. If you enjoyed this examination of the Turing test as a historical AI mistakes, let me hear from you. We've got a great channel that's growing here. I'd really love to have you subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed it. Also appreciate you giving comments. I read all of the comments. I want to hear from you. Thanks for taking a view of the video and share it with your friends. We'll see you next time here on AI Mistakes.